I was recently named to the board of the Academy of American Franciscan History and we had our board meeting here just before this conference and Dr. Timothy Johnson, who's an old friend of mine, had earlier invited me to come to the conference and I said there was no way I would be able to attend. Uh, but then I got the call saying I must attend <laughs> so, because of the board. Well, most of my work has been in uh, Franciscan history uh, from Francis to the present a special interest in California history. I'm a former member of the board of the California Mission Studies Association. Uh, worked for the last 10 years on the restoration of Mission San Miguel. So I have some local Franciscan history interests on the West Coast. Uh, my academic work is basically in medieval Franciscan texts. So I work on Translating, I worked for about 11 years with uh, Dr. Wayne Hellman at St. Louis University and Regis Armstrong at Catholic University of America doing this three volume set on Francis of Assisi early documents. So one of my big efforts has been getting reliable English versions of early Franciscan texts. And currently I'm working on a new edition of the writings of Francis in English. I'm self-taught in Franciscan studies. Uh, my own graduate work was in medieval Latin hagiography, saints legends, before St. Francis. Um, I never had a class on Franciscan sources, so this was a very good way to learn it. Uh, translating them with a great team, uh, having to establish context, do the notes, catch up on the research in other languages, so it was it was my education in Franciscan sources. My current project, um, probably two projects. One is uh, a new English edition of the writings of Francis, the complete corpus. Uh, the Latin critical edition was revised last year, and I was commissioned by our Minister General in Rome to produce a Latin English facing page edition. So there'll be one in Italian, one in Spanish, and one in English. So that's um, a project I should be finishing this year. And my other longer term project is an English language book on Franciscan mystical writers of 16th century Spain. So that's a course I've been teaching for many years. Francisco de Osuna, Bernardino de Laredo, and Bernabe de Palma all of whom had an influence on Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross wow. and Ignatius of Loyola. Yeah. That name, it's a very old name. Uh, it's pre-13th century. Is it diminutive in a sense of cariño, of endearment, or is it quite specifically a diminutive in the sense of making something small? I think its purpose probably was to make this small. It was a holding of the Benedictine monastery of San Benedetto on Mount Subasio in Assisi. Uh, it was clearly not the most important of the monastic properties. And the, uh, the, the word portio, uh, meaning an allotment, of land is familiar in the, the vocabulary of the time. The place itself was not considered particularly dear in the sense of um, a f that there was affection toward it because it was in a rather swampy area of the plains below the town um, affected by the, the river. Um, 
and at least before the lifetime of Francis was already the uh, the nearest chapel to the leper hospice of the town. So I think it is St. Mary of the Angels as, it's the, as the title of the church, and I think the geographical designation is almost the equivalent of the unimportant parcel, uh, the Portziuncula. Well, what St. Francis loved and what Thomas of Celano described may be two different things. Um, Francis himself only refers to St. Mary of the Angels a, a couple of times in his writings, and these are in the, uh, the Dictate on True and Perfect Joy and in the Rule as a place for meeting. What we hear from Thomas of Celano and also from some of the early companions is that it was the, the poverty and the smallness of the place itself. I think in that sense the name may have endeared itself to Francis, uh, but the name pre-existed him. The, uh, Thomas of Celano gives a kind of ringing endorsement of this place in his book on the, the remembrance or the, the second life of Francis. But I think that is Thomas of Celano with a bit of nostalgia. Uh, encouraging the friars to always hold on to this place, to esteem it above every other, that uh, Francis intended this as a kind of ideal community. Um, I think that's the nostalgia of Thomas. I think Francis had a great affection for the place, uh, but I think by the time we get into the 1240s, 20 years after his death, it's Thomas of Celano who's exhorting the friars, don't leave this place. If you get thrown out by the window, come in get thrown up through the door, come in through the window. But it was certainly dear to Francis because of his devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Uh, he made a strong association between the Virgin and the angels, especially San Miguel, St. Michael, the archangel, as a kind of bodyguard of the Virgin, so he always shows up near her in his texts. Um, and I think the fact that it was close to the lepers, I think all of those endeared it to him. Francis referred to himself in diminutive forms, and, and I think poverello or pauperculus was one of them. Um, he liked the diminutive when contrasting himself with people toward whom he thought he owed respect and reverence, uh, whom he identified with people who were educated, people who held important ecclesiastical positions. Uh, he always identified himself as the servant, uh, as the poor one, as the simple one. Uh, and the diminutive in that sense, again, as a not, not a diminutive so much of affection as of diminutive in size, uh, appealed to him. We also know that he was quite physically small. What about Francesco itself? Francesco is the use of the diminutive. I don't know. That name remains very mysterious. Uh, where did it come from? Uh, what was it, it, its exact meaning? If, it, if it's a reference to France or to Francia, uh, that would help to explain it. Uh, there are many legends about where the, the name comes from, uh, and there are many people who are quite sure they can explain it to us. Uh, the early texts themselves do not explain what the meaning of this nickname was. It was clearly not a Christian name because there was no saint named Franciscus. Um, the French certainly took it early on uh, to be related to the word Francia, but Francia at that time really referred to kind of French, what we would call today French-speaking Belgium, uh, Liège. Uh, why Francis would have any connection with that is difficult to say. Uh, did he speak French? Did he sing in French? People claim that he did. That seemed, there seems to be some evidence for that. And he did accept the name of Francesco? Accepted it. It seems it's the name by which he was known. Uh, what he had to do with accepting it, I don't know. I mean, he identified himself as Francesco. Oh, very, very clearly. He uses that name uh, in his, he only writes out his name once that we have in an autograph, uh, but he spells his name with two S's. So either, 
Well, he didn't know how to spell his own name because it wasn't anybody's name. Uh, so when he writes his letter to Brother Leo, in his own hand, uh, it, he spells his name F-R-A-N-C-I-S-S-C-O. C-O. C-O. It's an ablative, so he's, yeah. he's using a, a form of right. that in Latin. Francis is probably the earliest known composer in the Italian language, but not writer. So it depends on how you define authorship. Francis composes the Canticle of the Creatures in Umbrian, Italian. Uh, the Canticle of Exhortation called Audite Poverelle, uh, addressed to St. Clair and the sisters at San Damiano, also in Umbro, Italian. Uh, composes the Prayer Before the Crucifix, uh, also in Umbro, Italian. But none of them do we have in a written form from Francis's lifetime. Francis wrote, and when he wrote, he wrote in Latin. Uh, so he, he certainly knew how to write. He, as far as we know, uh, did not write, and I don't think we have any reference to him writing these poetic and musical compositions. He composed them. Well, we certainly have evidence from later sources that tell us that Francis, uh, that, that Francis set out for Spain and that because of illness he didn't complete the trip that he had intended. The difficulty is, where did he stop? Did he get 20 miles away from Assisi? and stop and turn back? Did he get 20 miles from Compostela, stop and turn back? Um, the friars in Santiago de Compostela will tell you that he got all the way to Santiago. We do believe that Brother Giles or Brother Bernardo did reach Compostela, but uh, there is some doubt about how far Francis got on the journey to Spain. And we would love to know. I think that the influence of the image of Francis and the, the influence that he has through various groups of Franciscans who come to the Americas is a story that is still not as well known as it should be. Uh, I think many people like myself uh, who grew up in areas of the country that were, uh, I grew up in the state of Washington where there's a very, um, very strong emphasis on English colonization, on uh, the, the other kind of East Coast to West Coast model of U.S. history, uh, you know, Jamestown to Vancouver Island, however you want to put that. We hardly knew about this Franciscan dimension of American history. Uh, and I think it's, it's been an education for me, especially the many years I've lived in California, to find out how much the, the Franciscan ethos and Franciscan history influenced the history of the state. Um, I'm certainly learning a lot more about that here in the Southeast, in uh, the Florida missions during this conference. And I've also been able to observe this in New Mexico and briefly in Texas. So the, I think the, the greater understanding that we have of Francis and what was important to him, the better we understand some of our own history in the Americas. And I think without that dimension or losing the, the specifically religious dimension of the Franciscan mission, uh, I think we really misunderstand a lot of our own early colonial history. Well, it depends on your historical perspective. A number of my Mexican and Chicano classmates will tell me that the province is no longer 100% Spanish speaking. Because as a matter of fact, since about the uh, 1850s, we've had people who spoke German and English and then other languages. So our province in California originally was entirely Spanish speaking. Uh, first Spaniards, well, Catalan uh, speaking Spaniards as well, Mallorquins, 
um, some Basques in there as well, but I think they used uh, Spanish most of the time among themselves. Uh, that history, I think, links us much more strongly to our roots in Mexico, where these Spaniards were trained, and then later, our later history where Mexican friars, Mexican nationals, staffed most of the, the conventos in California until the, uh, the period of the revolutions and the suppression. So for us, at least in the, on the West Coast, it's a kind of return uh, to an, an earlier part of our history. We've consistently had about 30% Spanish-speaking friars in our province over the last 100 years, and that's probably gone up a bit uh, in the last couple of decades, um, but we've all, always been kind of consistently bilingual. Uh, the friars weren't exactly favorable toward the apparitions uh, that occurred on the, the territory of the diocesan clergy. One of the, uh, the big embarrassments of Franciscan history of Mexico, I would say. <laughs> well, they came around to it. <laughs> they did, yes. Pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. I think it's consistent with uh, a Franciscan view of evangelization, this image of uh, the Virgin Mary as the poor woman, which was certainly unique, I would say, to St. Francis and to Franciscan devotion. Uh, her identification with the least in the population, that would be very consistent with a Franciscan view of how revelation works. Uh, and I think that the fact of the apparition being demonstrated through beauty, uh, particularly the beauty of flowers in the natural world, also makes it kind of simpatico to a Franciscan understanding. So even though the, the earliest Franciscan reactions to the apparition were um, suspicious, uh, not very favorable, I think what dawned on them quite quickly is that this fit very well with, if they thought a little bit about their Franciscan theology, it was very consistent with what they had learned. After you finish with Our Lady of Guadalupe, then I think your next project should be Our Lady of Zapopan. Yes. Because she and the, those images that come from, uh, I think, Fray Andres de Segovia around the Lago de Pascuaro, mm -hmm. That devotion, I think, is much more typically Franciscan. It's kind of a veiled devotion uh, to the Immaculate Conception before the dogma was defined. Uh, so that's, at least in Jalisco, as you probably know, another pretty popular virgen. I only say that because I used to live in Zapopan, so I, I think I have to be a little bit loyal to the Chaparrita. <laughs>